Okay. Now you hear me? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. I had some problems unmuting. Thanks for the talk. Very informative. Um, so first, a couple of impressions from me. Um, it sounds a little bit, little bit sometimes like, yeah, people involved in this development are paranoid, right? I mean, if I would, I mean, I understand what's happening and why it's happening, but if I would try to explain this, I don't know, um, to to my parents. Yeah, or to people who are not uh, into security and so on, it, 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 it sounds really, um, yeah, paranoia driven, which yeah, is, is, of course, the whole idea of privacy by design. But I wonder if, um, you know, if, um, if this wouldn't have been done by, uh, by, by a government or by somebody um, who's executing it for the government, but I mean, no, no private company would have ever gone through this kind of effort uh, to achieve a simple contact tracing, right? Well, I think it's an interesting debate. And I mean, I had many discussions with people about this. And indeed, especially if you talk to medical professionals, they say, I mean, we need more data. Um, if we want to control this pandemic, you should not be so careful. I think if you look at all the cases seen so far of abuse, it's more or less as we promised. And I think if you have one case of abuse, then everybody immediately will remove the app and then you lose all the benefits there are. I think it's a very delicate balance. And it's true that the, I think the, probably a large part of the population would have accepted something with location and whatever, and we're not going to abuse it and whatever, until there is an incident, right? And of also, course. I think the other problem is, personally, I think we should show it's possible to do it without violating privacy, because if data is collected, it will be abused. And I think in that sense, of it's course. a big win. We show it's actually possible. It's not a perfect system, and we show it's possible to roll something out for 50 million devices and to actually just have it do what it has to do and nothing more. It's not perfect, but it actually has a contribution. And I think sure. if there is one incident, people will remove the app, and then it's the end. I think Austria has, I Austria has this problem that they made some bad version in the beginning, and now they have a problem getting above 10% adoption. Because they once rolled out something which had some small flaws in April. Oh, yeah, I can believe that. Um, would, you, would you say the app is a crypto playground? Because it sounds like there's quite some, I mean, under the hood, there's a lot of different um, yeah, let's say crypto primitives and, and ingredients used for, for all, I mean, achieving all the little bits and pieces. Um, is there anything missing? Is there any major cryptographic technology that is not in there? No, in fact, it almost uses no cryptography. I didn't have time to go in there, but the only thing it uses is uh, encryption and one way hashing and MAC algorithms. So commitment. Commitment? That's a, that's a MAC algorithm in practice. Right? Mm. So it's HMAC okay. and AES. That's what it is. Okay, okay good. In fact, Fine. there is many fancy protocols, but in practice, they just don't work, right? Not on, not on the current phones and not with the current constraints. You can do much more cool things with pairings and whatever, but it doesn't work. All right, good. I'm going to read some uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, I'll start from the top of the list. So there is, um, and you actually commented already a little bit on this. Uh, the question is, one flatmate was quarantining at home. At some point, he woke up one morning with a high-risk contact um, on his corona, corona alert. We could presume that um, this must be from the neighbor whose bed is only one wall away from my flatmate. Um, this person must have had COVID. Um, is there any consideration of, of dealing with cases like this? Yes, it's called common sense, right? I mean, I think if you look at the system, it's unavoidable. Right? That if people have thin walls and whatever, and you sleep next to each other with a thin wall in between, it would not be possible. What you can do is, well, when you get a warning, you can think, what have I been doing? Do I really have a risk? You can also, if you're inside your house, in your room, you can switch off the app. Right? Then you will not get those warnings. But I think once you get a warning, you should probably interpret what happened. This is also why, um, I mean, we expect, it's a tool for users to inform themselves. It's not a decision on what should happen. And as I told you also that even in practice with manual tracing, there is also six out of seven quarantine orders are unnecessary. Well, in theory, we don't know which ones, are, which ones they are, but in principle, we do six times too many quarantines than necessary. All right. Next question is, um, would the accuracy improve with Bluetooth 5.1? I'm not an enough expert on this. Uh, I think what if, if you really want high accuracy, you want ultra wideband, probably. But probably you can do better things, but it's still a big zoo. There is many devices which have their own antennas and so on. So it's, it's actually the ugly world. It's not that there's one phone model with one antenna and one piece of, of, of driver or chip. It's just a messy world. 
And this is also why you need a big consortia to do this because you have to measure on hundreds of phones to make it work, yeah? calibration. All right. Um, next item is more, I think, something of a suggestion. It would be cool to make Bluetooth power threshold dependent on test capacity. So, you know, allow more faults positive if you have spare capacities. Well, there is now discussion in some technical working groups on making the Bluetooth threshold dependent on the South African or British variant, right? Because maybe we should now go to one meter or whatever. So we can do this. We can adjust the threshold a bit and see what happens. Um, it's not on capacity of testing. I think you want to warn people, even if you can't test them. This was, I mean, there was something we happened in Belgium, uh, end of October, the testing system got flooded because of the second wave. And then people say, oh, I can remove the app. No, because you can still get warnings. And with a warning, if you think it's a realistic warning, you should quarantine. Right? You can't get tested Sorry. well, that's frustrating, but you quarantine for seven or 10 days and you actually help people protect people. So it's not because you can't test that you shouldn't be warned, but the behavior of the virus that we may actually take into account in the parameters. All right, I'm gonna move on. The next question is, are there privacy related reasons or risks not to warn contacts after a positive result? I mean, why? I guess the question is, do people, do, I think people shouldn't be concerned. Of course, there is things you can't avoid, right? If you sit inside and then you go visit one person or you have one touching with a person somehow, you go have a beer somewhere uh, in a park, but you sit next to each other and you don't wear a mask. And then that's the only person you've seen. Well, if this person, is, I mean, if this person is the only person he has seen, well, then this person knows that you're infected, right? I mean, uh, any proximity warning, potentially, especially if you see a few people, is privacy violated. And that may be a reason. But it's still unclear to me, and I don't think there is enough research being done, why people actually decide not to warn. So this is some, a research question we will we hope to attack in the next few months. And unfortunately, I think it will still be necessary to work on this problem for until the summer. That's a socio-technic socio question, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to move I'm on. I'm in touch with social scientists about this. So. Excellent. So some people ask that they want to unmute themselves to ask a question. I'm going to skip those first and do those who wrote, uh, who bothered to, to type their question. And we'll keep, move the other ones to the end. Next one is, um, how would you change the current manual contact tracing process to better integrate it with the digital contact tracing process? Or would you prefer the two completely separated as it's currently running? For example, contact tracers who are part of the manual system could encourage patients to use the app more if there's enough capacity in the manual uh, contact tracing call center? Well, there is, I mean, the contact tracing system is, is um, quite complex, but there are questions asked about the app. And there is, come, I mean, there is a lot of thought has gone into how these things should together in Belgium. Okay, so it actually, it's not that we have two separate systems like some other countries, we actually have integrated this. This is also why I can show you some data because if you get contact traced, we ask some questions about the app. People are not forced to answer, but we have some answers of people. For example, they tell us they had a warning from the app and so on. So there is some integration. I think in general, contact tracing is very complicated and messy. And that would be my message. Also the, the backend system and so on. It's unfortunately, I think a big challenge in Belgium. Belgium is one of the few countries where there is a central database with all the lab results. The database is still not fully up to speed. And it's not uh, a point is, it's not to point fingers, but I have the impression that the labs don't do their best too much to give data. There is some labs that refuse to give data. There is some labs that come late with their data. There's some labs that keep resending data. There were some labs that change their mind about the test result and so on. I mean, it's, it's clear, but in the labs, they're investing in testing, but not in the IT systems. And this is something I was surprised not about. Not job, right? <laughs> it's of course rational for them, but I would hope that after six months in a pandemic, they would have at least have fixed this, but it seems they're not gonna fix this. That's the reality. If, unless there comes political pressure, they're not gonna fix this. Okay, next question. Looking into the future, is there a possibility to include vaccination data in the app? For example, high risk contacts with vaccinated people are not really a high risk. Again, right? we've been talking about this. Of course, we don't have test data yet. We don't know whether people who vaccinated um, are less infectious. There is no indications. If we would have hard scientific evidence, and by the way, all the parameters in the app have to go to the, the, the risk assessment group. So they have to be approved by the experts um, at national level. And this is the same in every country. It's not some engineer just twiddling with something. You have to explain what you want to do and, and what your decisions are. So it's something that I proposed already. Um, once we have data about people vaccinated being less infectious, then they can actually 
we can take this into account. Maybe they will transmit us less power or we send a bit so that we can weigh their um, codes. Um, but I think it's very important this is optional or whatever is unauthenticated. That people can decide themselves to switch this in their app and that is not a vaccination status. But I think that's a very dangerous slope to go to that we have an app that proves whether you're vaccinated or not. Because I think that people will start cheating with it and also it can be used for many other medical data and in the end you will be expected to have a medical passport that anybody can inspect. And I don't think that's the way we should go. But yes, we could take it into account in contact tracing as soon as we have hard data about it, which we don't at this moment. Unfortunately. So I uh, over reading out um, thank yous from many people. So many people, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation, much appreciation and so on. Um, um, I read this out just once. Um, and there's one more comment that I'm going to read. Excellent presentation. No question, but just, yeah, basically, I just want Willem to say. Ask his question. I'm very curious about this question. Willem Jonker? Which one? Willem Jonker said he wants to ask a question. I don't know whether he's still there. Um, yeah, he wants to ask a question, yes. But so I'm just going to read out one comment that says, I want to say, I just want to say, basically, uh, I'm very grateful. Fantastic efforts from researchers and developers involved in making the app and in making it work in a privacy friendly way. Great contribution to research and society. Um, now I'm going to give the word to Willem Jonker indeed. Yes, please unmute yourself. Hello, good afternoon, uh, Benedict, uh, for organizing this and Bart for, uh, again, an excellent uh, presentation. <clears throat> really uh, very uh, enjoyable. My question was actually, I mean, you see that uh, I, I observed two things. Uh, the general public is hesitant and doesn't see a really uh, very convincing factor improvement. And I mean, the graphs that you show, uh, show that as well. You, okay, if you do manual, it's great. And if you add the app, you get an improvement, but it's not doubling the effect, you know, which, which people start to understand. Wow. At the same time, also politicians seem to turn away a bit from it. Huh? And the focus is very much on vaccination, logistics of it, testing capacity, and the app seems to be disappearing a bit from the scene. Um, what can be done to revert that? Because we run the risk that all this uh, great technology is seen as uh, yet another technology push that didn't contribute anything in the end. So what needs to be done to turn the curve? That's one question I have. I have another question afterwards, if I'm allowed. Short I think one. it's a question which is not really my, my um, expertise. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about it, I'm struggling about it. It's indeed true that it's a small percentage, but I think it is actually important because you find those cases that manual tracing cannot find. And I think in this pandemic, um, every percentage count. Right? And I think the public indeed, it, it's hard to c convince them, but I think even if you can catch only uh, a few hundred extra people per day, it actually has an impact because in the end, it's a few people less dying. I don't think um, this is, you know, a massive, I don't feel, I don't think that people who made this app are heroes, but I think in the end, this app has saved lives and has shortened the pandemic. Even if the impact is small, I think politicians could do much more. As for example, also in Belgium, there is no politicians who want, especially in Flanders, no politician want to speak about, out about the app and defend it, right? It's indeed, it's not, a, they want easy successes. Mm -hmm. They want doublings. But I think in this kind of things, a few percent help as well. I think that's a very important message. And I think it's, it all comes down to communication. Um, and of course, I think also people have been over promising in the beginning. I, I tried never to do this, but there has been some uh, high expectations which were impossible to meet. Anybody could show it was not possible to meet this, right? Because if you have 20% adoption, that means that only one in 25 contacts will appear in the app, right? So you cannot never be more than a few percent. I, I fully understand. My, my next question is, uh, is a slight uh, different uh, question. I, I mean, the app approach is a, a one size fits all, right? I mean, everybody downloads the app and we try to do all over the place, uh, do it. Uh, you know, our uh, work, we are working uh, more with uh, alternative uh, technologies, but also with an approach where you say, let's target high risk uh, events, for example, and, and really uh, multi-spread uh, events because uh, those are very often in a confined environment. There could even be mandatory use of, of, of the app or whatever. And that's where you very often see super spread events uh, happening. Uh, do you experiment with that? Uh, is something going on like that as well? Or do is your position that no, in the end, uh, it's better to roll out the full app uh, widely and then use that specifically rather than going for other technologies that are 
for example, also then the offering the uh, possibility to use ultra wideband, for example, and use that in a very targeted way. I think it can have some value, um, definitely. I mean, if you, but I think there is quite some companies interested in, in bringing this solution to the market, right? For for sports events, I think it's interesting if you say it's mandatory and so on. I think you get and with very interesting legal problems. I would say good luck getting it past our privacy commissions. Maybe to come back also to your previous question. So when I was still lecturing live, I asked my students about the app. I mean, there were security and privacy students. I think out of 60 or 70 students in the audience, two didn't have the app. So also this perception that this app is not being used well among the students must have been very effective. Right? And so I think that's also something which is important that specific populations, if you can convince them to use it, they will actually uh, have an effective contact tracing mechanism for this population. It's a bit similar to your question about, about um, football games or, or some other big events, concerts. I think we end up with the question, can you force people to use it? And I think this is a question, if you can force them to use the app or some other device, I don't think it matters a lot, but at this moment, um, the political uh, setting is that you can't force people to do it. Even if it's privacy friendly, which I mean, I'm, I'm still a very big fan of free will and if people, um, I think I'm very reluctant to impose these things. In any case, people can then also bring a, a metal case and hide their device in a metal case and then uh, cheat your system anyway, right? Next question, um, I give the floor to Jan Tobias. Yeah, um, um, thanks so for, for allowing me to speak. Um, I think I'm in line with what William just asked for. I have two extra questions to that. That is A, um, given the very different budgets for the European apps that we are seeing right now, do you see any difference for how they work, how well they work in, in the case of the pandemic? And the next one is, since we now basically see a European pandemic response, why do we not see a um, united effort to develop such a tracing app across multiple national states? Those are more political questions. I don't know how far you want to go in, in answering them, but I would be really interested in your opinions. I have to be careful. I think. In general, I think most apps seem to work quite well because there is, I mean, there is only a few code bases, the DP3T code base, and I think the Swiss app is part from this, and I think also the Estonian. We decided to use the German code base. There is also the, the Danish code base. The Irish code base is used in Scotland um, and Northern Ireland. So there is a few code bases. Um, the problem in, in Belgium, we decided with the German code base, which I think is very good. Um, but my experience with Germany is that they do everything very good and thorough, but it's also very bureaucratic. So I mean, like, for example, this discussion about vaccination and change the parameters, okay? Assume that I could see a study that proves I have to change the parameters. I can probably get it implemented and rolled out in two weeks. My German colleagues say that if they want to get anything rolled out at the beginning of April, they should decide now. So I think their app is definitely very well organized and very structured, but of course, it's more bureaucratic and less flexible. Right? That's, I think that's the difference. Um, and then the problem we had in Belgium, this is more like we decided from the German code base, but they have so many developers that they keep changing their app all the time, so we can't follow. We made some changes, but at some moment they, they have so many developers on this app that in fact, I guess they're improving it, but it also seems, I have some suspicion that maybe because they have many developers, they make also many changes. So it seems that the, the efforts that work in terms of cost effectiveness very well is Swiss or Irish with a small dedicated team does it. Um, but everybody has had glitches. It's a very tricky thing to do. It seems a very easy app to do, but even Google messed up, right? I mean, even Google changed some configuration and stopped working over the whole world. So it's a, it's more tricky than we thought, as I would say, that's a lesson learned. Uh, I would advocate for agile teams. Um, in Belgium, we've been struggling with our limited budget and efforts. Um, I think we've been keeping up and we do a good job. Um, I would have wished the government would also have invested more in evaluation. A European approach would have been much more efficient probably a bit slower, right, before we with everybody aligned. But I think the reality on the ground is that Europe doesn't have this competence in healthcare, right? I mean, I'm, I'm now attending many European meetings and it's clear that the commission cannot impose decisions. Everything has to be coming from the member states. And France decided to have a centralized approach. And so the commission has to accept that. Yes, if you look at all the money, we would have spent half that money uh, on one app, we'd have had a much better app and a much better solution. But that's the reality of life, right? That's that's not how things work. All right, so there's one more quick question from Gunesh. What future research could inform the design and development of similar apps in the future, like privacy-preserving telemetry or analytics? 
I think there's lots of things to be done, right? I mean, indeed, uh, telemetry. Um, so the Irish and the Germans have added some telemetry um, in a not so privacy friendly way, just based on consent. Um, you could do it in a much more privacy friendly way to actually measure things, events without leaking what you're actually measuring. Definitely. I think the conferences in the next, in 2021, will be flooded with papers on proximity tracing. They will be very nice ideas. But I have doubts whether many of those are actually deployable with current technology. I mean, of course, you can assume that everybody buys a 30 euro device and then you can implement everything in there, but that's not the reality. Okay, one last question from Ville Uli Kaiden from VTT Finland. We have developed a battery powered tracing keychain token in a project, and we do have plans to make it compatible with DB3T. Do you have any insight? Would Google uh, or Apple or any other legal terms allow that? I think you have to ask them, but I think they, they would. I don't think there is a problem. There has been several talks about this. Um, I was hoping Europe would take the lead in this, but apparently there was not enough interest. But of course, in terms of privacy, it's a better token. And I would have been a big fan of having such a token. But I guess you should talk to Google and Apple. They're very open to discussions about this. All right. Thanks very much for this very informative um, and entertaining session. Um, several people had to leave already and say thanks once more, and we really enjoyed it, and so on. So thanks again for the talk. Um, feel applauded. I'll, I'll do that as a stand-in for all the other people. Um, just before ending the session, I would like to remind the participants the next um, seminar is uh, scheduled for the 25th of February, and it's going to be on deconstructing ethics for autonomous vehicles. Um, and um, also a request for proposing topics. So either if, if, if you would like to give a talk or if you have an idea for a talk that you would like to hear, um, um, please email us. You can, you, can find, um, you, can, you can find our contact information on the, on the CIF seminar website. Um, we have open slots again for seminars in March and April. Uh, thanks again for um, attending. Thanks again for the talk, Bart, and we'll see you in roughly two weeks. Bye. Bye.